Well, hello there again, YouTube. You know, I think I'm going to try something different here on one of these next upcoming videos where I'm actually not replying to Iowa Retro Gamer Dad. Uh, it's just really easy and tempting to follow up his videos because he hits on so many topics, especially as it pertains to uh, addiction and more specifically game collecting addiction. That it's, it's just, you know... It's, it's really compelling um, stuff to talk about. And, uh, you know, before I ever saw his video on it, and recently he showed a video from about 13 years ago with another cat, I think, named Mason, who had talked about it. So there's a lot of folks that have dealt with it. And I just wanted to share my personal story. Uh, I have been addicted to game collecting, and I, and I think... You know, I can honestly say I probably still am. However, I'll get into that in a minute. I have prided myself on being one of the only men in my family that never developed a substance abuse issue. Uh, my father and, and all the men in his family, almost all to one, are hardcore alcoholics, drug addicts, things of that nature. And maybe I got my mom's genes as far as that's concerned, but I, I don't like alcohol. I don't like substances. Uh, that's not to say I haven't been drunk. I haven't been high, uh, though, as far as the latter goes, the only thing I've ever tried is weed. And I've only done both of those things a handful of times. And the last time for both was probably well over 10 years ago, uh, well over 15 as far as weed goes. But I just don't, I don't like not being in control of my mind. I don't like feeling, I don't out of sorts. I don't like feeling off kilter. So I was always really proud of that. Uh, my father died from his alcoholism. When I say it killed him, I mean, it physically, literally killed him. He just basically drank till his body couldn't handle it anymore. And it shut down and he passed. And that was back in 2005. And, uh. Yeah, I mean, it, it was tough, and, and looking back on that, I wish I would have done more. Um, I haven't always been terribly emotionally mature, and I wasn't in a place to where I had the patience to help my father. And uh, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? But anyway, his, his addiction killed him. And, you know, I've always just been like, kind of puffed my chest out. Like, I've never had an addiction. And that's not to say that I, you know, have considered myself better than folks who have, you know, had substance abuse issues. Um, because I, I, I think everybody has their own addictive proclivities. And uh, I guess I never really thought about it too much um, until the last two or three years maybe three or four, but I think there's a lot of folks who just have a hole inside of them and they try to fill it with something. And even if it's things that only make them feel good in small bursts, you know, you get those, just that, that little bit of satisfaction there for a minute, those dopamine bursts, and then, you know, it's, it's back on to the next thing that fades. I think everybody deals with that to a degree, and it's just that some of us control it better than others. But for me, collecting in general has been an addiction that I have battled. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I went through this spell where I just collected action figures like crazy, and I wouldn't take them out of the package either. And uh, after a while, I just ran out of room to store them, and one day I just got overwhelmed with it, and I said, you know, forget it. I'm just going to sell the whole thing. And I did. Uh, I let the whole lot go for like $300, which was way, way under what they were worth at the time. And if I was to sell them today, geez, that same lot probably go for thousands. But when it was over and the, and the action figures were gone out of my apartment, I felt like a weight had been lifted. Right. And I went on for a while where I just, um, I didn't collect anything. Other than, you know, dust and vast amounts of resentment for the world. But uh, 
So then, and I'm not even sure when it happened, but I got into collecting video games. And uh, I guess I just, I remembered, uh, I guess, better times in my life and I got nostalgic for them. And it was interesting that that uh, the video Iowa Dad showed for the for the gentleman Mason. He was talking about the the odd thing was that he started off collecting for systems that he didn't have any particular attachments to from his youth, and that's how that's how it started with me. Sort of. Um, the first system I got really big into collecting was the original Xbox, right? And I set this goal for myself that I was going to collect the entire North American library for the Xbox. And uh, the reason I did this, it, it was stupid at the time. There were multiples. One, yeah, I fell into that trap of, of watching the big YouTubers, especially the big Xbox collectors, showing off their entire full sets. I'm like, oh, that is so cool. And uh, got that whole urge to, to keep up with the Joneses, have something I could show off and something that I could impress other people with. Even though in the back of my mind, I knew... Nobody's really impressed with that shit. Um, you know, I always I always used to have this fantasy in the back of my head that, you know, I'd have friends over and coworkers over and they would see my collection and they would just be so impressed with it. Even though fully well, I'm not a terribly social person and I can count on one hand the amount of times I've had guests over in the last, you know, three or four years. Um, so I don't know, but it made me feel good. Just, just the fantasy makes me feel good. And, you know, it's like so many things. A lot of times the way you build things up in your head is, uh, is uh, far more grand than the reality of it nine times out of ten. But, yeah, so I got on that path. And, I mean, I knocked the, the heavies out real quick. You know, I had all the high-dollar titles, which now are even have exploded even more, which is, just blows my mind. But I went through the same cycle that I did with my action figures. You know, one day I got the, I, for one, it was eating up a lot of storage space that I didn't have. And secondly, one day I just looked at it. And I'm like, I, you know, I'm not, I don't show these to anybody. And I'm not playing them. The vast majority of that library, I wasn't going to want to play. And uh, so one day I just got that same impulse I did with the action figures. I'm just like, you know, forget about it. I'm done. I'm going to go sell these at the local game exchange, which I did. And when I tell you, I probably, you know, I had over 500 titles, and I think the whole library is like 800 some odd titles. So I was closing in on having the full set. And uh, I must have spent thousands on those 500 titles. And in the end, I, I cleared it all out for probably about three or $400. That's what I got for it. Which I could have gotten way more had I decided to, you know, sell them piecemeal on like eBay, but I just didn't have the patience for it. And that's how I've gone with my addictive, you know, pursuits is that it's fun for a long while. Then one day I just wake up and have this moment of clarity. I'm like, fuck, what am I doing? Oh, sorry for swearing. I'm really trying to lay off swearing in these videos, uh, trying to make it more kid friendly, you know, especially since I have little ones and I wouldn't want them to hear me swearing like that. But yeah, I'll just have this moment of clarity and just decide, you know what? I'm done. This this is not this doesn't serve me anymore. And the funny thing is, I still collect video games. And I still love the thrill of the hunt. I love, you know, occasionally finding like high dollar titles for, you know, pennies. And it, you know, I don't have to tell you that that doesn't happen very often. It, it it's probably, you know, a once or twice a year thing. Um but I've, I've, I still have the impulse to want to collect, you know, and, and that's like, want to, there's that part of me that wants to buy every game I see, right? But I've limited myself now. I've gotten a lot better about it, about controlling myself. And before I buy a game, I ask myself one question Can I see myself playing it or can I see, you know, my children playing it? Okay, so that's two questions and enjoying it. And if the answer is no, I don't buy it. Um, in addition to collecting original Xbox, I, I had a, a collection, a library of about 125, 130 titles to the original Nintendo as well. That was a system I did have a childhood attachment to. I did, you know, get the warm fuzzies when I 
think about uh, opening up my first Nintendo and, and playing Iron Sword because that was my first game that I got with it. But I sold that off too. Again, I wasn't using it, so I sold it off. Now, later down the road, I did start back collecting, but again, with the new guideline. If, I, if I'm not going to play it, I'm not going to buy it. And right now, my collection as, as a whole sits at about 1,030 titles, and that may sound like not much to some of the bigger collectors, and that may sound like a whole lot to some people. But the common thing is they're all games that I can play, and they're easy to store. Now, for what I am going to collect, I have written myself out lists for each system. I'm like, okay, these are the games I specifically want. And then once I'm done, I'm done. I don't buy any more for that system. Matter of fact, for the NES, I think I have 30 games, and I have like maybe two or three more that I want to buy, and then I'm going to be done. Uh, I've done that with the Nintendo Switch. I've done that with the PlayStation Portable, uh, Xbox One, PS4. There's just a handful of titles for each system left, and then I'm done. I'm not buying any more for them because there's just not much that interests me. Um, outside of that, the only thing I buy for is, you know, if I can, if it's something that I know has a little bit of value and I can flip it or I can add it to the trade stack or trade it for something I do want. But I think addiction, it can be controlled. You know, you just, you have to set boundaries for yourself and you do have to stick to them. Um, looking back on it, I know that I was trying to fill some sort of void in my life. And I, and I think we all struggle with that. And I'm still trying to fill some sort of void. And, and don't get me wrong, like, you know, I have a great life. Love my wife, love my kids, you know, my home. But there's things I wish were better. There's things I wish were more fulfilling. But I've come to learn that, you know, the, those small dopamine hits, they're, you know, they, they, can't, they can't affect any real change. You know, that's 100% has to come from within. And I know how dopey and cliche that sounds. But folks, we're, we're all responsible for our own happiness. And there's not any amount of things in the world that can uh, fill a void if there is one. I was watching uh, a video about the passing of the late Matthew Perry. And uh, the the uh, the YouTuber who was talking about it, he was reading some highlights from from Matthew Perry's biography, and I'm not usually one to get messed up by the deaths of celebrities, but Matthew Perry, what I understand, was just like this legitimately good dude. Like, he had his demons, but he was a good dude. He tried to do good in this world. He tried to help people. But the issues he laid bare, he was talking about as a young man, how, you know, he just, there was something inside of him that was missing. And uh, in his early teen years, he tried alcohol. And he said for the first time in his life, you know, he felt right. He felt, you know, complete. And of course, then, you know, that kind of didn't do it. So he legitimately, he said that he wanted fame and fortune. He, in his words, said he wanted it probably more than anybody ever wanted. And he actually prayed to God for fame. And the big reason he wanted fame was not for fame's sake or for money's sake, but because where he lived in Los Angeles, he would occasionally see celebrities and he would see how they lived and how it seemed like on the surface they didn't have problems, they didn't have issues, like they just had everything going for them. And, you know, and, and their life was just all roses, which I, you know, that's not the case for anybody. I don't care rich, poor, famous or not, you know, everybody's got their issues. Everybody's got problems, but that's how it seemed to him. So he, he got the fame, he got the fortune and along the way developed an opioid, uh, opioid addiction because the alcohol wasn't cutting it anymore. And he said, even after all that, he still felt the void inside his soul and his heart. There was just something he couldn't fill. There was just something that just made him incomplete. And if the truth were told, I think everybody that battles addiction, that's what it is. It's they're either trying to escape some sort of pain or trauma, or they're trying to fill, they're trying to fill a void. And the problem that most of us that feel that way, that feel like we have a void, 
is figuring out what's causing it and you know, trying to identify. <sighs> this is tough for me to talk about, I'm sorry. But trying to identify what that void is and um, how to fill it in a healthy way, how to feel complete and do that without having to rely on outside things and people. Anyway, uh, you know, comment below if you've uh, ever battled addiction or if you're battling any sort of addiction or uh, you know somebody that has, particularly as it pertains to this video, game, game collecting addiction or collecting anything addiction or just relying on things outside of yourself to make you feel happy. Just tell us your story. Anyway, if you found any value in this or if you just for whatever reason, like listening to me ramble, uh, God bless you. Um, leave a thumbs up, comment, subscribe if you haven't. Anyway, um, I've got to be to work in an hour, so take it easy, y'all.